really spread very much here is that we're, and I'm watching the data very, very carefully. Thank you, Dr. Bardock. That's actually a wonderful segue over to um, Dr. Monica Gandhi, who's an infectious disease specialist at um, San Francisco General Hospital and UCSF. She is going to be talking with us about the vaccine and the variant. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay, so we'll just go to the next slide. And we'll talk about, yeah, we'll talk about variants. Um, but when we talk about vaccines, though, I want to actually remind us just for our own information that there are nine vaccines out there. Um, so it's a pretty amazing time to have had nine vaccines developed so quickly. Three of them are, um, we don't have great uh, peer reviewed data on those are the three bottom ones. Uh, the Covaxin and the Sinopharm and the Sinovac. Uh, we're waiting for the longer data on that, but the five, the top six ones, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, AstraZeneca, Novavax, and Sputnik, we have a lot of information on. And of course, we'll just focus on the top three because those are the ones that are available in this country. Next slide. So um, all six of those in that top uh, part of it actually work on the spike protein. And boy, was that the right one to choose. And what the spike protein is, it is um, the, the piece of the virus uh, that sticks out and binds to your cell and can enter the cells that way. And the place where it binds is called the receptor binding domain. So all of these vaccines have something to do with coding um, the spike protein in the receptor binding domain, not part of the virus. Next slide. And as you've already heard a lot about just in the news, of course, the two, um, the two, the Pfizer and Moderna uh, ones are called mRNA vaccines because inside this lipid package is an mRNA genetic material that you as the host take that mRNA, make that mRNA into protein. And then that spike protein that you make looks foreign to you. So you raise a very robust immune response to it. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is on the top, is a different sort of formula that it's um, inside a virus, an adenovirus that causes a cold usually, but it can't replicate in your body. And then inside that virus is DNA. And uh, then that, that adenovirus kind of brings it in and then that DNA, same thing, gets made into mRNA and then the spike protein, you raise an immune response. AstraZeneca and Sputnik are also adenoviral uh, vaccines. And then there's one called Novavax, which is just the protein, spike protein itself. But again, I'll just focus on those three that we have authorized in the United States. Next slide. You can't actually talk about variants or vaccines or anything about, um, uh, about virus, about vaccines without reminding us of the immune system. So just to spend a minute on that, it's really two arms of the immune system. You hear probably too much about antibody responses, which are actually not the main way that we fight viruses. Uh, B cells go to plasma cells and they make antibodies. That's not, um, that's not the main way we fight viruses. Our enduring form of immunity and the major immune defense against viruses are, is cell-mediated immunity. Cell-mediated immunity is kind of two types. Um, the T cells are divided into CD4 cells, which are called helper cells. And helper cells, you want a Th1 skewed helper cell response to, to have a good response against a vaccine or a virus. Um, and then there's also CD8 type cytotoxic T cells. The reason I mention this is all the phase one and two clinical trials actually took the time and the effort to measure cell mediated immunity um, that was developed against the vaccines, which gives us confidence that we're gonna have a very in breath, that we do have a very in breath response to vaccine that includes cell mediated immunity. So that when we talk about variants, we can quell our minds when we know about um, uh, uh, the protection that T cells give you against variants. Next slide. So, you know, this is very busy, but actually we'll just focus on the top three rows. Again, the Moderna, Pfizer, two mRNA vaccines and the, and the Johnson & Johnson is the, uh, uh, the adenoviral DNA vector. The top two are two doses and the Johnson & Johnson is one dose at this time. I told you, and this is why I really, really wanted to stress by the fourth column that they took the time in the phase one, two trials to measure CD4 responses, uh, CD8 and CD4 responses in the case of Pfizer and Johnson and & Johnson and showed very strong, beyond neutralizing antibodies, very strong cell-mediated immunity develops against these vaccines. They also protected child, um, macaques, all three of them, from um, getting the virus again if you rechallenge them. 
And then they were studied in very large populations. These are 15,000, uh, uh, 18,000, 22,000. Uh, these are people who just got the participants who got the vaccine and then double that for the, the number of people that or, uh, take half of that, uh, the same amount for the number of that placebo. And the reason that I highlight this column number six is because they all protected 100%. Um, Dr. Fauci really highlighted this at the White House Task Force meeting yesterday against severe disease. So the most severe outcome, they're actually 100%, not like 99% effective, 100% is sort of amazing. And this wasn't really uh, seen um, uh, with vaccines before. So the most severe outcome that you can have, which is um, hospitalization and death from COVID-19, those were protected for by the vaccines. There's just one person in Moderna that they adjudicated did go end up going in the hospital um, who probably hadn't developed the, the, the immunity, uh, but everyone else uh, was protected from that severe outcome. And the same is true with even severe disease where you were managed at home, equal protection, really high protection, um, 100% in most cases, and we'll go a little bit into the, um, the Johnson Johnson vaccine when we get to the data. And then mild disease is where um, efficacy uh, differed. And I'll talk about that in a moment as well. Next slide. So to give you some details on these three trials, because these were the ones, and it's important for me to say, actually, these three trials are very outdated information because we have so much real world data on how well these vaccines work that I'm gonna actually stress that more um, in this talk because beyond the 44,000 that were given um, you know, vaccine here, we've given these doses out to millions and millions of people now, right? And the, and the um, eff effectiveness, what's called effectiveness when what happens in real world versus uh, clinical trial, which is called efficacy, the effectiveness is amazing. So Pfizer, two shots, 30 micrograms, three weeks apart. And of those who were reported on in the clinical trial, 50% were females, 82.9% white. So there was some African-American representation, 28.8%. 28% Hispanic and Latinx populations. There was representation of people who had pre-existing conditions that could predispose to severe disease like obesity and diabetes. And um, it was very uh, efficacious, meaning of the 170 people who became infected, 162 were in the people who got the salt uh, shot, and then eight were those who got vaccine, but they all had mild disease. Severe disease, um, again, it protected 100% against. And then uh, the next slide, the Moderna trial, equal really findings, um, uh, two shots, 100 micrograms, four weeks apart. This was almost 50% female. It was still, uh, oh, they, they each uh, did enroll older individuals. So 25% were over 65. Here, 36.5% of participants were from communities of color. 22% had some high risk condition. And then again, um, of all the total symptomatic final infections, most of them occurred out of the 196, 185 occurred in the placebo group. So it was 94% effective, uh, efficacious. Again, there were 30 severe outcomes and they actually all occurred in the placebo group, but the FDA went back and said, you know, there was one person who was hospitalized um, for, um, uh, for um, uh, hospitalized for COVID in the, in the vaccine arm. So there was one that, and they did fine, but they did get sick. Next slide. The Johnson & Johnson uh, phase three trial was actually conducted across more diverse sites, meaning the US, South Africa, and Brazil, those others were mostly in the US. And, um, and they were 45% female, 34% were over 60 years old, and more representation from communities of color. 17.2% were either African-American or African, and 45% were Hispanic or Latinx. And 41% had comorbidities, meaning they're more likely to get severe disease. Um, but still, you saw, next slide, the incredible um, uh, ability of this vaccine to prevent severe disease of 468 symptomatic COVID cases. Anyone who got uh, hospitalized for COVID uh, or who died, unfortunately, of COVID were all in the SALT arm, uh, got the placebo. No one was in the vaccine arm. And then against severe disease, meaning like you were at home, and we really do need the full, this is the one I showed you on the first slide, but we don't actually have a peer reviewed report. Here we have the FDA report, so we do need a full report. But there were some people at home uh, and, but they were called that they had bad disease. It, it, there was equal efficacy across the three sites, South Africa, Brazil, and the US. But interestingly in Brazil, 69% of the 
um, virus circulating was the P1 variant, the so-called Brazil variant, and 95% and, um, of the strains in South Africa at the time were the uh, B1351, which is the so-called South Africa variant. So um, it was equally effective against those variants for severe disease. The efficacy varied in terms of those three sites uh, against mild disease. But again, we do need the paper to understand what was mild disease. And I'll tell you one thing that I think was a problem with this trial. They looked at outcomes zero to 14 days after people had gotten the shots, but the phase one, two trial showed us that your CD4 count, CD8 counts, and your antibodies keep on going up and up and up out to 59 days. So we think that it would be more effective if they had waited and adjudicated outcomes after 28 days. And I think we have two things coming, which is again, the peer reviewed publication to see if that's true. And the second is, um, the two-dose study, which is called the Ensemble 2, which is underway. Next slide. So um, uh, will the vaccines work against the variants? The answer is simply yes, and I'll explain to you why. Next slide. Um, so I needed to explain the immune system to explain to you that antibodies, when we measure them, uh, we actually do not measure a bunch of different antibodies. We, we measure once against receptor binding domain, we measure sometimes once against the nucleic capsid, and we measure once against the spike protein. We don't measure antibodies that develop along the breadth of the spike protein. However, T cells, when I told you that they were measured, they're really complicated to measure. They take flow cytometry machines, are very complicated, but we're able to measure an in-breadth response. And you develop a very broad T cell repertoire against multiple parts of the virus in natural infection, um, just against the spike protein itself multiple epitopes across the epitopes mean little pieces um, across the spike protein. So you're developing a very robust T cell response for natural infection. Next slide. And then after vaccine, what, uh, what has been found is that um, they took people who'd been vaccinated with mRNA vaccines and then put their blood uh, in a test tube essentially with, um, with uh, variants, with the B117, which is so-called UK B1351, South Africa, P1, uh, Brazil, and California variant. And the T cell responses were equally intact. They were completely as robust and strong against all the variants um, that you developed from mRNA vaccination or natural infection incidentally. And this was actually shown, not to get too complicated, but this was shown in the AstraZeneca trial as well. A trial was stopped prematurely, which I think it shouldn't have, but, but the severe disease outcomes were protected against because um, you had very robust CD4 and CD8 responses develop against uh, the B1351 variant in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Actually, there were 87 T cell epitopes that you get alone, uh, 87 parts of the spike protein um, that, that you develop uh, T cell responses to, and 75 of them are preserved with the South Africa variant. So you have plenty to cover you. Next slide. And um, this is a paper just published today, hot off the press. It was highlighted by NAID or NIH because this was, um, this was uh, supported by them. Same, same thing that I just said. Essentially, CD8 cells, um, there are 52 epitopes along the spike protein. And with any variant, uh, the, the Brazil, the, the UK, the P1, uh, the P1, B1351, like 50, 51 out of 52 of the epitopes worked with the, um, the, the CD8 cells um, were responsive against uh, these quote mutated spike proteins. So I don't think we need to worry about the variants. I, I do understand the news has, um, has certainly uh, made it not seem that way, but I think it's important to look at immunology. Next slide. So RNA viruses do mutate, but actually this doesn't mutate this fast, which is why I don't think we're gonna need um, Emily, yes, uh, which is why I think we don't think we're gonna need a lot of uh, booster. I don't think we're actually gonna need boosters frequently. Um, in fact, I'm not sure we're gonna need them at all. And T cell responses are preserved against variants for the NIH uh, data and the data I told you before. And sure, we can tweak uh, vaccines in the future if need be. I, companies are certainly interested in making money and making those tweaks, but I don't think they're gonna be needed. Uh, next slide. Do the vaccines reduce transmission? Short answer, yes. Um, next slide. I will skip this one because it's too much to go into and I only have a little bit of time. However, essentially, I told you that the, you know, the, um, I mean, the only thing I want to say from the other slide, and you don't have to show it, is that IgA, which is the immunoglobulin that you produce in your nose, 
um, is produced at very high levels by these vaccines. So we always thought that they would block transmission. And then this is a nice study from Mayo Clinic where people after they're vaccinated, they, they keep on swabbing them um, before procedures, uh, but their rate of symptomatic infection went down, of course, um, but so did the rate of asymptomatic infection by 80% after just one dose. Um, and then next slide, we actually have at this point, oh, I'm sorry that one of my slides went away. Can you go to the next slide? I'm sorry. I wanted to actually show you that there are seven studies now at this point. So um, that, and you can go back to up to the previous slide, but we have now have seven studies. I only showed you one, but there are studies ranging from uh, up to 94% reduction in asymptomatic infection. There are now actually eight studies, including one yesterday, which led the CDC director today to comment that yes, we at this point, especially from the CDC study yesterday, know that vaccinated people cannot carry the virus. So this has a lot of implications for you not being able to transmit after you've um, been vaccinated, which is great for, for vaccinated and unvaccinated people being together. Next slide. So um, a couple of more slides on vaccine effectiveness, and then I'll stop. Um, you know, I thought you thought it looked good in the clinical trials. These vaccines, next slide, the vaccines look much better in, in real life. Next slide, please. Um, this is data from, the, um, from Israel, from the Ministry of Health, but essentially uh, their real world program, and they put out this data very poignantly a year after the WHO declared this a pandemic on March 11th, 2021, showed that it was 97% effective against symptomatic disease and then 94% against asymptomatic infection with regular swabbing. Uh, people who are in the hospital with COVID-19, and this is true in, in the United States as well, are those who are not yet vaccinated. Um, and this was, by the way, during a time where 80% of the circulating virus was B117. Next slide. Um, Another amazing real world data, if you look at the bottom panel on the left in Israel, they had 90% of their over 60 year olds vaccinated. So they uh, opened up, uh, they stopped their lockdowns. And again, the top panel shows you that anyone who goes to the hospital with COVID-19 is not um, vaccinated yet. The same findings have been shown in uh, the UK um, with both cases and hospitalizations plummeting, but they adopted a strategy that was uh, unfortunately much not unfortunately for them, for, unfortunately for us, much faster than our strategy for a variety of reasons. Next slide. Um, this is what mass vaccination looks like in the US. This is just data from today that in nursing homes, uh, the death rate has gone down by 91% and cases have plummeted by 96%. The reason that community has only had a 72% reduction in cases since December um, it's because the community is not uh, why we do not, we have not achieved mass vaccination. As of this morning, 28% of us in the United States have received one dose. So we're about half the rate of Israel and the UK. Next slide. Um, and then these are uh, studies from healthcare workers that were published in the New England Journal in March 23rd. But you can just see, someone said to me, you don't need a p-value for that right hand uh, uh, um, uh, graph there. But to put it very simply, 26 out of 1,000 people before mass vaccination of healthcare workers could get COVID. And then after this, 0.5 out of 1,000 people. So you need 2,000 people and then one to get one case. Next slide, the same findings were shown yesterday in the CDC report um, that just again, this was across multiple states, first, uh, uh, first case responders. To put it simply, out of 1,000 people, there were 161 COVID infections prior to vaccination, and after that, there was one out of a thousand, um, and they were asymptomatic. So next slide. So vaccines are incredible. <laughs> I'm not really exactly sure how to overplay it. Next slide. Um, and the CDC has given appropriate guidance at this point that vaccinated and vaccinated people can be together without um, masking or distancing and vaccinated around unvaccinated who are not susceptible to severe disease like children um, also can be around each other without masking and distancing. Next slide. And I think we have to just really celebrate the optimism of these vaccines. We're not where we need to be in this country with rollout. We're gonna get there and we are getting there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi, for that wonderfully informative talk. There's some really excellent questions in the chat. Okay. Um, one is, um, 
so um, Oakland uh, Unified uh, School District Certificated staff are going to be returning mid-April. And at that point, many staff will have just had one shot so far. And so there's a lot of questions around, you know, when, when do these shots really become efficacious? Um, how long after the first? How long after the second until people can, can feel protected? Yes. Um, you know, there was a model with Pfizer that after the first dose, you're 92% um, protected. And then the CDC data showed yesterday that after one dose, the uh, your rate of protection is 80%. And then a study from Israel showed 85% protection after one dose. So anywhere, I would say between 80 and 92 protection after one dose, which is reassuring, um, especially if you're waiting for your second dose. And then you're right, I see a question, but it is true that, um, when I would have loved to answer the question about surface transmission if we end up wanting to do that, maybe you already did. Um, but um, but uh, uh, that it is true that we will have good efficacy, uh, effectiveness after one dose, um, and it takes about two weeks to develop that protection. Thank and two you. weeks after the second dose to be maximally protected. Thank you. And then um, next question, you touched on this, but it's such an important point. I want to make sure we're able to offer it again, which is um, when are we going to need to repeat the vaccine? Is this like the flu where we're going to need to get it annually and get our no. boosters? No, I think, you know, again, we're in a very transition period with um, with understanding of the virus. And there's there's understandably a lot of people who've just kind of jumped into the mix and, and made a lot of commentary about that. Um, the influenza virus has a, what's called a very leaky polymerase, meaning um, it, it mutates at a very rapid rate. The, the SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses have something called um, a very strict proofreading mechanism. And they actually don't mutate quickly. I do realize that the news has been only about variants, but um, they don't mutate quickly. And we don't believe that once we've given the virus, stopped giving the virus a chance to transmit, which is tamping down transmission, which certainly didn't happen over the winter surge, that the virus will be mutating that quickly. In addition, you actually have to compare this virus to its friends, and its friends are not influenza, and its friends are not cold coronaviruses. The most closely related viruses that cause severe disease, coronaviruses, are called SARS-CoV and MERS. And importantly, SARS-CoV, which was the first SARS pandemic in 2003, people still have immunity after getting infected and they've looked at their blood um, 17 years later. So I don't actually think we're gonna need booster shots for this, but I do understand that that's the next thing the news is talking about, but I don't think, not by the biology. Thank you. Um, sort of related to, to some of what you're speaking about in relation to variation and variants, um, are, are we in for a fourth wave um, and how might this impact uh, schools? I don't think we're in for a fourth wave in California, and it's not for great reasons. Um, it's actually because we had a really severe third dose. So there are three reasons that I don't think cases are, we're, we're, in, we're in a very low period of community transmission across uh, most areas in California. And the three reasons I think we're not gonna see rise in cases is one, because the restrictions that we're maintaining are prudent, we're not wide open. To be fair, by the way, there are places that are wide open and they're not seeing those increases in cases. So I do think it's also the second reason, which is unfortunately, we, we got a lot of natural immunity in California. There was a um, California DPH study uh, that was, um, the Chronicle covered it, but it hasn't been published yet, that 30% of Californians after the third wave have were exposed to COVID-19. And 29% in, in San Francisco were the lowest, but up to 45% in LA. And then depending on the county, different very uh, different rates, you can just look up Catherine Ho, San Francisco Chronicle, and there's a whole map on it. That natural immunity that we developed from the third, from the very, our very severe surge, plus rapid application of vaccines, which we are doing, 42% of San Franciscans have received one dose of vaccine that is um, so much higher than the national, which is 29.8%. Um, I, I, that, those two things, those three things put together mean I do not think we'll have a fourth surge in California, no. Thank you, I recognize we're asking you to, to uh, tell us the future. Tell the future, yeah, I'm um, pretty sure. 
and then one final question, which is um, less directly related to what you said, but was the very first question asked to us today and comes up frequently, which is um, re related to transmission from, from flushing toilet seats. Yeah, so I did had wanted to answer that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the reason that this even came up at the beginning of this pandemic is no one knew what was going on. I mean, and I'm so sorry about all the misinformation at the beginning because uh, it was sort of everyone was writing up everything and it was all in the news and it was a panic time. And so it can be spread by surfaces and fomites and toilet plumes. And, and none of that is true, actually. But, but it took careful research to show that it wasn't. Again, just because you can culture it from a surface, and this speaks to the disinfection question that someone asked. Um, to put it very cleanly, you would have to have a thousand, a hundred people sneeze on a surface and then lick that surface to get um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission from a surface. So this ex excess disinfection that's occurring in multiple settings, um, I, I'm actually very personally concerned about it as an infectious disease doctor that it's going to lead to antimicrobial resistance. And I would definitely not make that a very big part of um, school protocols. And no, you cannot get it from flushing toilets or shared bathrooms. Thank you. These are so questions that were asked at the beginning of the HIV pandemic. So I do understand these types of questions, but it's not true of COVID either. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. And that's actually a beautiful segue into the final part of this presentation where we'll talk a little bit about um, how do we actually make this happen at school? Um,